Hey folks, how's it going? Welcome. Thank you for joining me for handling ransomware incidents, what you need to know. So I'm just gonna get cracking right away. I have a bunch to talk about and I love to run my mouth. So I'm gonna do that now. All right, I am Ryan Chapman. I'm the author of Forensics 528, Ransomware for Incident Responders, which is the course that I'm teaching here. I see some of my students trying to get like extra credit points. That's cool. <laughs> I appreciate you showing up though. I am also an instructor for Forensics 610, Reverse Engineering Malware, although I've been primarily focusing on my course because it's my little baby. I work as a full-time, or I should say full-time and a half or double full-time because that's what IR is, incident response consultant for a large consulting firm. So I deal with ransomware day in and day out, pretty much. I also help organize the Cactus Con conference in my local home area of Phoenix, Arizona, and the United States. So I'm from an area where it's, it's a desert, basically. We have cacti and then uh, more cacti. And so being here and seeing, well, the bikes are throwing me off. There's a lot of bikes. <laughs> it's like the city of bikes. And then you show up and you're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> I, I kind of get that. But really the canals, the rivers, the trees, the people, the smiles, it's like, it's really cool being here. So I'm very excited at the opportunity to be here. And I want to take this opportunity to just kind of run over and run through some things that are kind of specific to ransomware when it comes to incident response. So if I'm gonna show of hands, how many folks work incident response? Or if there's an incident, you'll be involved in the response efforts. All right, so a good number of the folks in the room. Okay, great. So when you deal with like an advanced persistent threat group or an SMS phishing group or a SIM swapping group, it's very different than when you're dealing with ransomware. So I'm gonna cover some of the things that are different and explain why they're different. Okay, our agenda for right now is first off, don't panic, calm down, it's fine. And that's up there because the first thing that every victim organization does is absolutely panic and just freak the heck out. And it's a good darn reason as to why they do so. And we'll talk about that. Next up, hey, guess what? Don't panic, all right? So calm down, everyone's gonna be all right. Roles and strategies. I'm gonna talk about the roles that are inherent to the overall response effort. And I'm gonna talk about some strategies that are useful specific to dealing with ransomware. Ransomware sucks, but there are some ways that you can handle it that'll make it a little easier for you overall. It's still gonna suck, but you know, it can kind of alleviate some of the pressures and psychological damage that you're gonna suffer. And then we're gonna talk about dealing with an active threat. You may come into an incident when the ransomware actor has already encrypted the environment or they maybe have not yet encrypted the environment. And then the clock is really ticking. So how do you deal with that type of situation? What do you do? So first and foremost, I'd like to just shout it out. What's your favorite ransomware? Anyone? No one's gonna fall for that, really? <laughs> Come on, I had a whole setup. Seriously? I just made this slide. I was waiting for someone to yell, I like Lockbit, like, damn you. But it didn't work out. Fine, next slide. All right, <laughs> you ruined it. You all ruined it. That was horrible. I was so excited. I was going to get one of you. It's all good. All right, so ransomware sucks. How much does ransomware suck? This is an example of how much ransomware sucks. This is my, my little baby course range that we had developed and created with the assistance of SAN's SROC team, whose job is to basically facilitate and assist us authors building out ranges and making cool data sets for all of you to go through in our courses. We built out this range and this was the day of our pen test. So we were gonna have a team called Red Siege actually. They do a number, shout out if they're watching or see this recorded. Red Siege, their team comes in and does the actual red team activities, right? In this case, I handed them a very specific set of instructions. They were going to carry it out line by line. Their comments typically were, why would I do this? This is basically, to put it bluntly, this is so stupid. Why would I do this? It's really noisy. It's extremely aggressive. It's not covert in any way, shape, or form. And I said, because it's ransomware, that's why you're going to do it, right? So I had this whole list of things to do. I had the range, and I made it vulnerable on purpose by using, I believe the password was winter with a capital W, 2018, exclamation point, at sign, Octothorpe, which is a fun way of just saying pound sign. And I left the range vulnerable with RDP open with that password for the administrator, the standard administrator named account. It was vulnerable for no more than 10 hours as I slept. And I made the joke, wouldn't it be funny if a threat actor got in and did something stupid, right? So I woke up and we were going to begin step one out of like 200 something steps for our first scenario. 
I logged into our range and I found this. This is not us. This is a ransomware threat actor who targeted, well, I say targeted, who found our range, happened to guess the password correctly, got in and ransomed our environment. I don't think you can give, like come up with a better example of how pervasive the threat is than when you build a range to talk about and to train people on ransomware and the damn thing gets ransomed the day before you intend to do it. Like seriously, like talk about irony, right? Ransomware sucks, but don't panic. There are some things that you can have in your back pocket to kind of assist with the overall response efforts. First and foremost, ransomware is a bit different from something like an advanced persistent threat or general espionage style attack or responding like a coin miner style attack, which are getting far more sophisticated in odd ways, by the way, like seeing cobalt strike used for coin miner attacks, like really? So when you come into the environment, do you know if you're technically in the initial access stage or if you're in pre-encryption or post-encryption? How do you really know that? Well, first off, you're gonna know the last one right away, very quickly. Right? Is the environment already encrypted? That's probably why you were brought in in the first place. That notification probably came from a user. Hopefully it didn't come from you personally, but it, someone saw a ransom note. It was like, hey, <laughs> we're gonna have a bad month or five. So if you come into the environment and you don't necessarily have the encryption already done or in place, but its potential is very, very high, the stakes of that game are ridiculous. And the amount of pressure that you're gonna feel and that everyone involved, everyone in that response effort are gonna feel is going to be immense. And that's very different than when you find an APT actor in your environment. Yes, the pressure is horrible and it sucks, but you're not just waiting for them to essentially click a button to shut down everything. Cause that's not what they do typically, right? They wanna do espionage. They wanna look around and steal your data, not necessarily shut down your entire business model. And that's the fear that you run into when you're dealing with ransomware. So if we take back, if we take it back, and I mean like back back a little bit to, I think it's 2010. Yeah, to the 2010 M Trends report from Mandiant, they proposed this concept of a strike zone. So I have the older PDF up from 2010. And if you take a look here, the section is actually entitled section four, what to expect if you are a victim of the advanced persistent threat. Not what we're talking about right now, right? But they're proposing, here's what you kind of have to expect and here's what you need to worry about and here's what you need to do. That's what we're gonna be talking about, but for ransomware and here's how it differs. They propose this concept called the strike zone. I haven't heard this terminology used in a number of years, but the concept still remains the same when dealing with these types of cases. If you take action too early, to get the threat actor out of your environment. You're like, no, go away, right? However, you have not properly enumerated their overall capabilities. How are they able to get in? How are they maintaining their footholds and persistence? What methods are they using? What tools are they using? What accounts are they using? If you don't already know all of that and you take an immediate action without doing your proper research first, it's you know a baseball analogy, right? You swing too early and you strike out. You miss it and you just aggravate them. An example being, let's just say you see a threat actor coming in via RDP and you go, no, stop it. And you kill RDP services throughout the organization, but they're also using your VPN. They're coming in via Citrix. They're coming in via their malware as a service implants that they have, all these other ways. You're just basically going to piss them off and they're going to then increase their activity, you know, X fold. Okay, so the idea is if you wait too late, then they're just gonna start kind of changing their tactics on their own. So you have to find this sweet spot, this strike zone, right where you wanna swing. I propose that for ransomware, it's quite opposite. If you find a ransomware operator in your environment and you are dead set on, that's ransomware, what's your job? Anyone? What's that? I like it, take a fire ax to them. That's a little violent, but yeah, <laughs> sure. I like it, exactly. Get them out of your environment. Now, might you end up playing a game of whack-a-mole, essentially? Yes, but your overall thing is you're trying to stop them from recognizing, oh, look, they see that I'm in here. I'm just gonna deploy the ransomware encryptor or payload. So a couple things to keep in mind about working these cases and learning and enumerating the overall capabilities. We work these backwards. We don't necessarily work them like, oh, look, I see an incident, uh, an incident about to be kicked off, like you're clairvoyant, I guess. Oh, look, I see an alert. A threat actor has just gotten into the environment. 
and they're gonna start doing some bad stuff, right? Rather, many times you identify it via a ransom note. You're told, hey, we encrypted you. They'll even give you their name many, many times. If you wanna see some example ransom notes, you can go to my courses share. We have a share that's open to the public. So if you go to for528.com slash share, and then you simply just click on example ransom notes, you'll see a bunch of example ransom notes that you might find, right? Well, hopefully that you personally won't find, but that can be found. And if you read one of those, you'll basically see that they'll say like, hey, yeah, this is the Conti group. This is Black Basta. This is so-and-so. We did this. Sucks for you. Here's how to pay us money. Go give us money. We want money, right? So if you're in that situation, you're going to be given a, a lot of pressure to fix the problem. But usually you have to work it backwards, right? The threat actor got into the environment. They maintained and set up established, I should say, persistence. They then ran their scripts and their tooling and they brought more tools in. They started grabbing credentials out of memory and dumping your credentials. They started moving laterally. All of that happened before they even started to touch your actual data, let alone start to exfiltrate that data, let alone the end result of all that, the major impact item is drop the ransomware cryptor within your environment. You find the ransom note, you start working backwards. Where the, was that ransom note identified? Where did it come from? Where was it deployed from? Probably one of your domain controllers, chances are. And then from there, what connected into that system? What processes were utilized? What tools were used? What accounts were used? You have to work backwards. And one of the last things that often you'll identify is how the hell did they even get in and how long have they been inside your environment? Meanwhile, while you're trying to work in a backwards fashion, you're getting bludgeoned with questions as to why we are not already restored. Why are we not restored yet? I don't even know when they got into the environment. Well, it's been 24 hours. Why aren't we back up and running? Well, uh, 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 while you're trying to answer that, how'd they get in? Well, I, I know they got to our DC. Uh, what they do before that? I, I'm trying to find out. I have a team of 20 people working on it, or maybe you come from a team of two people, or you're the one people that's working on it, right? So the, your, these questions, what did they take? What'd they get access to? What systems did they move to? This entire time, you're trying to work backwards to answer these things. And yet the overbearing tone you're going to hear is, hey, again, why are we not back up? Well, what does backup even mean? What backups can you use at this point in order to restore services that are gonna be quote unquote clean? How do you identify that? You have to proceed throughout the investigation. So you basically take, it's like you're in a race car with the pedal floored and they're like, why aren't you going faster? You're like, what? That's it's all the way to, I don't know, I can't do it anymore. So it's a really odd situation because you cannot simply just begin restoration because you haven't even entered into the containment phase yet. You don't even know, you're not even through a scoping phase really. And everyone who's part of the business, part of a shareholder group for the business, whatever, wants the freaking thing back up and you cannot do that yet. And all you can do is feed them, oh, I'm looking at these things now. They don't care what you're looking at. I'm looking at tasks. I'm looking at scheduled tasks. I'm looking at services. I don't want to hear that. What did they take? I, I, I don't know. How many uh, file servers do you have like at all? I can look at those. How many do you have? Oh, we don't know. Okay, awesome. <laughs> like not even knowing asset management, it, it all just starts to blur and it starts to become very, very difficult for you to just do your job because you're constantly being barraged with why is it not yet fixed? Advanced persistent threat cyber generals, cyber crime, even business email compromise. The timeline you're working against is longer. It may not be super, super low, but it's longer. When you have a complete impact to the business and your moneymaker is down, right? You don't have a moneymaker, that's no good. Then all they want is for things to be up. And that's very specific to dealing with ransomware cases. So let's talk about some roles and strategies. First off, who's gonna be involved overall? Who's gonna be responding, clicking on things, on phone calls, in the war room? These folks still have war rooms. Any of you have a war room still? Some of you do? All right, cool, I like that. So, and then strategies that can help you with everything, basically. First and foremost, I personally believe that ransomware is one of the major types of incidents that involves the most number of disparate roles needing to be involved. So in other words, you're not just gonna have your response team. It's not gonna be your SOC and just your CERT. It's gonna be every technically adept person that you have within your organization is gonna be required. So you're gonna have to have an incident lead or commander or potentially a pool from which you can pull 
commanders because you can't have them basically working 24 7 seven days a week and expect that one person to continue through right you're going to have to have someone who's documenting often referred to as a scribe that can be common with many incidents right however these people are going to need to liaise with leadership and the executive team who will often be on what i like to refer to as a bert it's just because it's a funny term bert 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 reminds me of sesame street so the business incident response team is not necessarily the technical folks but rather it's the team of people who can make big boy decisions big boy and big girl decisions if i come and i'm the case lead and i say hey we need to cut all internet connectivity now or you're going to be ransomed do you already have established a bert does that bert have the authority to make that decision can they give that decree to do that? And if they can't, who do they need to contact and how quickly can they do that? And if you don't have all of this pre-established and these groups working together very closely, you're gonna have a bad freaking day or uh, entire year potentially. So you might have your other technical folks like your SOC and your CERT working, but you're also going to need to have your internal IT teams. You're gonna have to have your networking, your data center, your application teams, your server teams, you name it, whatever teams you have in IT, you're gonna need them involved. Because if you need to deploy software, where does it need to go? Oh, it needs to connect to these subnets that are actually uh, not connected. I need to have a deployment beacon uh, host, or not a beacon, uh, bastion host set up so I can deploy from these various environments. All right, that's gonna require server teams, gonna require networking teams, gonna require the general IT, maybe even the help desk folks, right? You're gonna need a lot of people with eyes on the prize and that are kept up to date as to what general phase of the process you're in. And that can be very different from dealing with an APT type of situation. If you have third parties that are involved, MSSPs, MDR, managed detection and response, managed threat hunting. If you have, uh, they say MSSP, I did say that. Any MSP, any third party vendors might be able to be of assistance. I highly recommend if you find yourself in the midst of a ransomware incident, you call your firewall company, you call your VPN company, whatever the heck your service is that's a critical to your network infrastructure, you call them and you say, hey, I'm in, the well, okay, hold on. <laughs> First off, <laughs> maybe don't tell them immediately, I'm in the midst of an incident <laughs> and start freaking out because then that might get out. But with your NDAs in place and proper reporting <laughs> procedures in place, let them know I need resources immediately and find those resources, you might be surprised how many of them will already have like sales engineer or security engineering, SE, hours with you and vice versa that you can actually pull from, or maybe you need to just purchase some and get some additional hands on deck essentially to help you out. If you have a team who I say, hey, I need you to cut the network now. And they say, you know what? I've actually never done that before. I need to research how to do that. And I'm like, that's precious. We don't have time for that. So who can do it? Maybe the vendor can do it. And that's why you might need to pull them in to be essentially a, an extension of your IR team. And then for the business team, you will often be dealing with legal counsel, internal and external. You're gonna have to clear a lot of things with them related to ransomware response. And if you have a threat actor who's threatening you, saying that they're going to expose your company and, and call all your vendors and call your stakeholders and all these things that they do on a daily common basis, you're gonna to need to have legal be aware of what they're threatening so they can help you make decisions. You're probably gonna to have to have your insurance group involved and you're gonna to have to have them plugged in with potentially your legal counsel and your public relations teams. You may even have to have human relations and negotiators brought in. Human relations, HR might need to be involved if you're going to say, hey, I need to have this person work 12 hours today. And they're like, that person's in the EU, that's not gonna happen. It's a Saturday, it's a holiday, something like that. You have to have them involved to actually get the approvals to do that. Did that sound bitter when I said that? <laughs> the US, they can just make us work all they damn want. Oh man. So these groups that need to be involved, like public relations, when you have threat actors claiming, we're gonna put you on our data leak site, we're gonna show how much data we have from you. You need to have the authority and the people that can truly make those big decisions aware of what's going on. Because if you make them as a responder yourself, you're gonna put yourself in a really, really bad place. And you absolutely don't wanna do that. So when you're working a general incident, you don't typically have half your executive team in a war room. But when you're working a ransomware case, you absolutely should definitely have that going on. All right. Communications, here's a strategy involving communications. 
Ransomware actors love to negotiate. They love to negotiate. The first value they give you is not always what they're truly going to accept, the lowest they're going to accept, if you will, right? It's like bartering in a market. However, what I want to push, like what I want to get out to you is that negotiating can buy you time. It's the first thing on the slide here. Negotiations can buy you time. Not only can they buy you time, but even if you never plan to pay a ransom, if your entire company's motto is we will never pay a ransom ever, it can buy you time. And it can also, the second item up here, second set of bullet points, you can get them to reveal information to you that you don't already have. And I see this happen all the time and I hear about it reported in the news all the time. A threat actor group is communicated with, the group says, we have all your files. And your response is usually what? What files? Prove it. Show me your file. What do you mean you have my files, right? They may show a file listing. They may give you some example files. If they give you a partial file listing of the things they've taken, you go and you find out where are those stored? What file servers or backup servers or whatever? What servers then have those mapped for like network shares? Is ADFS involved? Like all those things. And then you have other places for analysis and for forensic work to be done, right? So you can get them to break operation security. When I say you, the third set on this slide here, I don't necessarily mean you or you or even me for that matter. I highly, highly, highly recommend against you and your direct team engaging with the threat actor, as will your third party insurance, who will probably be extremely stressed out if you're like, yeah, I chat with them for like two hours. <laughs> I just call it a bunch of farts and then, yeah. Like they're not gonna wanna hear that, okay? Also, these people, they, their psychological pressure is that they implement is, is very, very high. They're manipulative, extremely manipulative. And they get you to feel as though you have no recourse other than to pay them or every, the world's gonna fall apart. The sky is gonna fall, right? And that's exactly the feeling they're going to try to bestow upon you. They have knee-jerk reactions. If they get angry about something, they can just cut all communications and then just release your data and move on to the next victim. So I'm not saying you, 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 but engagement in general can assist. If you've ever wondered, what do some of these engagements look like? I have a link here, 4528.com slash ransom chat is a newer site that was only up, I don't know, not too long from now, uh, a couple of weeks, I think. And it has cataloged some, some are redacted, some are not exactly redacted. These ones are communications with threat actors. And I wanna give you an example as to this one claims to be from Black Matter from I guess uh, Q3 of 2021. And you can see here the victim says, hi. And the Black Matter representative says, hello. And they just begin a conversation, right? So right away says, hey, it looks like you screw, I mean, encrypted us. <laughs> And then Black Matter says, oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I can help you out. Uh, what can I help you with? That's a cute question. Like, obviously, fix the deal. Like, <laughs> duh. What can I help you with there, buddy? Oh, gee, I don't know. Just wondering if you had the time. Come on. So in this case, the victim is basically saying exactly what we all kind of surmised, right? Like, prove it. Prove that you've done did what you said you done did. And they come back with, okay, I'm going to give you some data to download. In this case, it's like, well, we didn't get it quite yet. Okay, I'm going to get you the data. Here's the data. Redacted link. Don't try. Oh, I'm going to go look at their data. No. And then they say, it's a little bit of a sample. Here's some more. It's a file tree. In other words, a listing of stuff that we stole from you, right? The response basically, all right, I'm going to go have management review that. That's kind of a go-to right there. Is, all right, I'm going to take that to my manager like you're buying a used car. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, I take that to my manager, kick it around in the back for a little bit, right? So in here, they're like, well, Tell you what, we have these databases. Can you show us that you have data from those particular databases? The response that comes back is uh, no, because they're databases. So we're not gonna waste our time to basically pull that individual data out. We just grab a bunch of data in aggregate. We're not gonna show you that. So in here, they, they're basically getting impatient after a couple days passes. Keep in mind, a couple days passes, but communication is occurring even if it's not necessarily actively occurring. You're still engaged and communication, right? If I scroll back up to the top here, this started on August 29th, and we're already down here on September 5th. If I scroll down to where we were, if I find that, over here, when they, the victim does get back to the threat actor, they say, basically, we need all these assurances. 
Now, are they really prepared to pay at this point? I have no idea. I don't even know who this victim is. They could just be buying more time, right? It could just be a ploy, a tactic, and that works very often. In this case, they say, all right, we're increasing your timer so that you don't have to pay, you know, once the timer expires, like, whoop, the bomb's gonna go off kind of thing. And then down here, they're like, all right, we can pony up 150. And the response that comes back is, we know your cash flow, and yeah, we're not asking for an overpriced amount. It was in the 4 million something range, by the way, nowhere near 150,000. So the response comes back, you know, like, hey, hey, things suck right now. We're a small company. We don't have significant capital. And their response is, we can give you 20% off. Our best offer is four to 4.5 million. All right. So I guess originally it was up in the 5 million area. So that's okay. Thanks for the little bit of discount. Appreciate that. And then eventually, all right, look, we, we worked with some bank stuff. Maybe we can do 250, right? Again, do they really mean to pay this at this point? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that's literally all they actually can get. Or maybe they're just buying even more time. It's already September 7th by now. Their deeper teams are working probably around the clock. Their third-party consultants, whoever it is, to find all the answers they could possibly get to deal with the answer of, are we actually going to have to pay this? What are we going to do when the data gets leaked? You're not buying time just for the deeper team. You're also buying time for public relations to talk to all the different legal entities that need to talk about all the reporting requirements so that you know and understand what you're gonna freaking do before you get into a lot of trouble before the threat actor does it before you do. That's what you're trying to avoid. Eventually they say down here, you know, uh, check it out. Okay, the max we can do is 350. And they say, no, it's not, it's too low. Don't try this, save your time. Like you're wasting our time. So the response then comes back like, all right, well, I think we can do 500K, which gets down to, yeah, get 1 million more and we can do a deal. So from 5.55, whatever it was, my math was off there, down to 1.5 million. And it ranged over 10, 11 days of communication. Did this particular group intend to ever pay? I have no idea. But you can see right here, the general negotiation process buys you time. And in this case, they gave a number of example files to the, the, the victim. They call, them your, they call you partners, by the way. They'll often call you a partner. Hey, partner. And you're like, that's cute. Don't call me a partner. Uh, but either way, you get the idea. It can be advantageous, even though it might be sickening to engage. All right. So speaking of advantageous, anyone have the time? I didn't have a clock on me. Awesome. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Speaking of advantageous, always try to find the good with the bad. And when it comes to ransomware, I'm going to tell you right now, it's a bit twisted in how this works out. But there's some huge bonuses in it from a first party perspective. Those things that you've been asking for, that you've been quote unquote wanting, i.e. needing, like maybe what led to this entire damn incident, right? You might just get those. Finally. Yes, that's ridiculous. Yes, that sucks. But at the same time, you might get the darn things. So take advantage of that, right? Turn, turn the sad into a slightly smile and then bring back to sad probably since you're working around the clock for the next couple of weeks or months. All right, so let's just say you've been asking for MFA to be implemented in six different systems or just one and ah, it's not in the budget. And you're like, it's not in the budget. Okay, well, look what just happened. They got into our VPN. They got in because we don't have MFA. They successfully fished and got it. Oh, so we need that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need that. See, here's the proof that we need that. And then you get it. Yes, I know that you're like, that sucks. It does. But you know what? There's some positive there. So take it. All right, another, the last little strategy thing. This is something that I've been pushing for a while. It's not industry standard. I'm trying to make it industry standard. I personally recommend that if you have critical data that's been encrypted, that you're not going to be able to restore or rebuild easily, or that you're just going to have to lose some of that data, even if you get a decryption key, for example, that you back it up. And the reason I say that, if you have the storage and you have the means and it won't be super costly or whatever, right? There's a risk analysis, cost benefit analysis to this. Back up that data. And the reason I say that is many times keys will become available. Some groups have just gone away, like the Avedon group and the Maze group and the Gregor. When they went away, they just gave their keys out. They're like, ah, we're done, right? Were they really done as, as threat actors, as ransomware operators? No, they were just done with that brand name. They're like, this brand name sucks. I'm going to go make a new one, right? And so they gave all the keys out. 
Sometimes, like recently, the Beyond Leon group, they tried to roll their own crypto. They didn't use standard encryption libraries and they got a little fancy, but made a little boo-boo and ended up embedding the private keys into some of their samples, which, oops, allowed a bunch of decryption to occur. And so a decryptor was released by, I believe it was Avast. I think it was the Avast group. If you're interested in learning more about like the downfall of a group and then how eventually stuff was able to be decrypted, Go check out, there's two articles that the team over at Redacted, and that's the actual company name, by the way. The name is Redacted, and they have uh, square brackets around the name for stylization. And, uh, but look at Redacted, BN Leon Ransomware, and you'll find hopefully not just Redacted reports, but the actual, the two documents. And in my class, we'll go over them tomorrow, by the way. So many times a decryptor or a decryption methodology will become available down the line. And so because of that, it may behoove you to just squirrel away some of that data. And then we get into dealing with an active threat. So ransomware threats, you want to minimize two primary things. Number one, well, first off, just get them out of your damn network. That's what you wanna do. But you wanna minimize the amount of data to which they're going to have access if they're in your environment or if they're able to get back in after you get them out. You don't want them to get access to your data. So what do you do? You stop offering data. What does that mean? I'll show you. It means pretty much cutting things out that like otherwise you would not do because you need it. And the other thing is that you don't want them to be able to deploy their ransomware. So you cut their abilities to use mechanisms and protocols that are utilized to deploy ransomware throughout your environment. So let's get into this. First and foremost, evidence preservation becomes key. This is not just in ransomware. This is in every type of incident that you're gonna be working, but with ransomware, just ever so much because you need to have your eyes on all the logs possible. You need to have your host logs, stuff that's in your SIM, your firewall logs, you need to have all those things. They like to roll over or rotate, if you will. Don't let them, do not let them rotate. Begin collections of your data as soon as you can, like your firewall. Say you don't have a SIM. You don't have a nice expensive Splunk instance running in the background where you're offloading all your syslog data to and you have it stored for three, four years, right? Rather, you're like, yeah, the disk holds like, I don't know, three weeks, right? And you're like, well, okay, I don't know how long this actor's been in your environment, so let's start dumping those logs, right? Start dumping them out like now, get them out now. And then for that matter, can you increase the retention on any of your general artifacts? If you have packet capture, how, how much do you have? Oh, we have enough disk space for about three days. Can you temporarily increase that maybe? Can you, you reuse a SAN you're using elsewhere? Can you just increase that retention so that we're not losing additional visibility? Because once you have a ransomware actor in the environment, the questions that you need to answer, the more data that rotates off, you're not gonna be able to answer. And when you can't answer what they've had access to or where they've even been, which servers they've even accessed and things of that nature, it gets real ugly. When you then have to talk about reporting with council and with insurance organizations. It gets really, really ugly. For memory, I don't personally recommend trying to run memory captures if you have an, like on an active host in an active segment where encryption is occurring, let alone if it's on that host. Stop the freaking thing. Don't try to capture memory. You're gonna lose that race condition. However, if you have a virtualized system that you can pause, which will then write the memory usually to a file, like, you know, VMware and it's VMIM files. Awesome, then pause it. I don't think they do yet, but up to last I checked, Azure doesn't let you pause VMs. For example, you can shut them down or let them keep running. And some people will ask me, do, should I go ahead and try to like run win PMIM and grab memory? No, you should not do that. You should secure those freaking machines. And if you can't pause them, then I guess you gotta shut them down. All right, next up, systems may be down upon which you greatly depend to perform your response activities. So think of this, in most ransomware cases that consultants like myself find themselves working, Active Directory is not available, it's down. Why? Duh, because the servers are encrypted, right? So when you think, oh, well, okay, you come in to help me as a third party, or if you have your own solid team and you're like, no, we wouldn't even use a third party, we're good. And you're like, okay, cool. How are you gonna deploy scripts to collect forensic artifacts if you don't already have previously established agents deployed? They go, oh, I'll just use uh, PDQ deploy. Will you now? Because the Active Directory's down. Oh, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> well, how would I do that? Well, you tell me. 
how are they connected? Are they connected on LAN segments? Can you basically just use the IP addresses? Can you do an ARP A and find local hosts and then push things to it that way? Do you have physical access to devices? Can you take USB drives and plug them in and collect artifacts that way? You may have to do that, right? So what access do you have if Active Directory is down? And think of that from the perspective of your InfoSec policies. Do your policies, whether it's your business continuity, your disaster response, like whatever, however yours are formatted and drafted and whatever, do they take into account that Active Directory may not be available? Many times they do the exact opposite. And many times they're stored on servers that get, guess what? Encrypted. <laughs> and then damn it, you don't even have those documents available and that sucks. All right, also communications. Out of bands communications can be necessary. The threat actor may be in the systems that you're using, including like in your EDR. So if you're making changes in your environment and they just go live terminal in via your EDR and just undo what you did, they're like, no, I want that, that's dumb. <laughs> they just try to stop your response to them basically. So do you have third-party chat communications? Yeah, that's not really specific to ransomware, but it's very important in ransomware cases. You want to protect your crown jewels. I propose your crown jewels are not just the data sets that you claim or that your executives or whatever state or tell you are your crown jewels, but rather are your backup servers, all your backup whatevers, along with your virtualization mechanisms infrastructure. Reason being, threat actors love to go after both of them because all the things they want are located in those two things. What do they want to do? Get all your important data. What do you typically do with your most important data? You back it up, right? So they want to go grab the backups. They don't want you to be able to back up after they encrypt or destroy all your data. So what do they often want to do? They want to encrypt your backups or just outright destroy your backups after exfiltrating sometimes a lot of the backed up data. Your virtualization infrastructure, your ESXi boxes. If you're in an active incident, I recommend highly being very weary of your, for example, root password for ESXi. Threat actors will get those, we talked about these in class today, from password files sitting on the desktop of IT administrators. Yes, it's very common that they do that. They'll store those passwords. IT folks will store like root passwords to in critical systems in like WinSCP and FileZilla and tools where the threat actor now has access to them. Once they're on a box, they'll save the credentials to vSphere in their darn browser. And once the threat actor's on the box, they have access to those credentials. Rotating credentials and securing those environments is one thing, but pulling the suckers offline is another. And it's something that I have requested many times during response or told people they should do in general for third-party consulting. You may need to physically, literally pull the cable out and be like, nope, no network for you, sucks for you. They're like, well, we won't have backups then until it's put back on. Yeah, correct, but you will have the backups that were there because you're securing them. And that might be the better choice, right? You let them, your overall teams, your legal, your, all the executive teams, and that's why you have a BERT, 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 right? That's why you have them. You let them make the decision, but that's your recommendation. File shares. If you have a threat actor in your environment and you believe they're a ransomware actor, you may need to kill your file shares. If you have ADFS, if you have just a standard bunch of logon scripts that run net use, and you have a ton of file shares that are just being accessed remotely via SMB, can you kill SMB internal connectivity? Can you literally just turn those file shares off? Can you disconnect their network connectivity? However you have to do it, do it. And you may need to kill administrative shares via a group policy object. That is a somewhat nuclear option. It's not quite nuclear, but it's not far from it because you're going to break a ton of things within, within your environment. You won't be able to PS exec after that, for example, we talked about that today. So it's important that you keep in mind, what do all my users have access to and the threat actor has access to those also. So do we need to pull them offline, right? So the previous slide and this slide go kind of hand in hand, pushing that little panic button that you see there. If you have file synchronization agents, can you kill them? Can you stop them from working? You don't want them to synchronize anymore. Just stop that capability. Can you push out an app locker to basically stop them from working temporarily? I've seen people do it, it's effective, right? You may need to disable accounts. Be very, very careful. You're not disabling the accounts that your team needs for response purposes. Because if you kill those, well, that's kind of a stupid like, duh. <laughs> if you kill the ones you need, uh, duh, then you won't have them. Don't forget about appliance specific accounts. 
many threat actors will get access to your service accounts that are used on things like your firewall or your VPN or your whatever other devices. And you don't want them to get access to those and maintain access to those. If you have to disable them, keep in mind though, what you're actually disabling. How do those appliances use those accounts? Why do they even have them? Is it just using user attribution? What's that? Oh, is that from outside? Oh, I got excited. What? Huh? <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, question, how many of you, ha you don't have to get too specific, right? But how many of you in the room have like a firewall that has for whatever reason, at least one Active Directory account that it uses to authenticate into via Kerberos or something like that? Only a couple handfuls? Okay, those accounts are especially susceptible to be utilized by the threat actor and they're typically usually, usually over permissioned, not just exactly what they need, but they have much more than that. And you have to be very cognizant of that. Next up, we're gonna talk about the nuclear option as we kind of close things out here and that's going dark. First and foremost, can anyone in the room tell me, except for my class, because we talked about this already, can anyone in the room tell me how do you know when you have a ransomware actor in your environment? When can you tell legal, hey, uh, this is, I know who this is, or I know what type of group this is? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. The response for the online folks is a ransomware note shows up. That's how I know, right? You can follow TTPs and you can follow IOCs and you can correlate those and you can go, ooh, I think I have this particular group. Or for that matter, this has gotta be ransomware, right? I'm pretty darn sure this is ransomware. But what I just said doesn't translate very well when you approach legal and you approach your CISO or your C-levels or whatever and you say, hey, I recommend you immediately cut all ingress and egress from the internet. Why? Oh, we have a ransomware group in our midst. How do you know? I have a darn good feeling, <laughs> right? They're gonna be like, what? At what point do you really know? Well, if they bring in a ransomware cryptor and it gets caught by your AV and you go, oh, 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 go dark, go dark, damn it, go dark. That's my recommendation. Good luck getting that across the board, by the way, for them to do it. But I've had many situations where going dark potentially saved the client. And by the way, notice I said potentially, it's very difficult to even prove like, I'm glad you did that. And then, you know, you killed your own revenue of whatever millions of dollars. Uh, it stopped you from getting hit with the cryptor. Well, how do you know that? Well, you didn't get hit, right? <laughs> it's like you didn't get encrypted. So like, obviously we made the right move, duh. When you go dark, a couple things to keep in mind, focus on interconnects. I've had people tell stories. I've seen ransomware events where they're like, oh yeah, so we went dark and then like two hours later, the ransomware operator deployed the ransomware. You're like, wait, what? It was an insider threat? No, no, we totally forgot. We had ingress points in AWS and GCP and they were just in those servers and whoops. And then they were in our entire data center going nuts, right? So be careful for that. Does your team have the knowledge, the capability and the know-how to quote unquote, go dark? It's seemingly a simple thing. How many egress points do you have? How many points of presence do you have? Shut the BGP down, right? Is that it? Are you dark, right? Probably not. So do you have a core network services team? Do they have control of your networking fabric enough that they can help you properly go dark? Most companies, that answer is no. And most companies, the response for me is then, well then plan all that out beforehand and your firewalls stage the rules that you'll need. So all you have to do is go commit. I wanna commit those rules, go dark. You don't wanna have a team say, oh, we need to go dark immediately. Awesome, give me about 12 hours to research. <laughs> I'll get right back to you, all right? Like, no, that's gonna be a major failure right there. Also, if you go completely dark, that can be kind of stupid. Reason being, you might have an EDR. And if you do, it's probably cloud-based. And if you go completely dark, now you has no EDR, right? Now, now you've lost all your visibility and access into your own environment. You're gonna have to have pinholes for that. What about a VPN? How are you getting into your own freaking network? Probably via some type of VPN or a remote access gateway. Do you have pinholes for that when you quote unquote go dark, right? All of these things need to be thought about well ahead of time because when you come into an, an environment and you start Googling things and you're going, you know what? Uh, per Google, this looks like the Royal Ransomware Group. There's a script name that they like to use. There's a tool they like to use, a port scanner they like to use. I, I think this is Royal, 
right? So what are you gonna do in that case? In that case, you wanna get them the heck out of your environment. And if you're sitting there and you're like, I have no idea how deeply they're in here. And at any point they're gonna see that I see them. What could be the response then? Going dark, getting them, that's how you really get them out of your environment. It's a massive risk analysis, cost benefit analysis, but luckily most of us don't have to make that. <laughs> Any of the C-levels watching are like, cool story, Ryan. I'm like, I know, <laughs> it works really well for me. I just say do it. Okay, finally, recovering from backup. You have to be very, very careful. Your IT teams in general will want to start restoration processes. Right here at SANS, we've taught you for, I don't know how many years now, the pickerel process, right? Prepare, identify, contain, stop the thing, eradicate all the, the bad, right? Then remediate. No, 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 no. Your IT teams are going to be like, we're down? Well, that's dumb. I recovered from a backup from 48 hours ago. Like, wait, what? I don't know how many times I've heard that. Oh, yeah, we backed up from, uh, from backup. We're good. What backup? Uh, the backup that we had. <laughs> what backup? What date? And how does that correlate to when the threat actor got into the environment? And that's one of the fun things going back to the earlier part of the conversation about the ticking time bomb basically in your timeline is that how long does it take for you to identify how long the threat actor has been in your environment? If you can't answer that quickly, then you're not gonna know if you even have backups you can use in order to restore where they're not still gonna have their implants and just be able to connect right back in because they've already done the ugly, dirty stuff. The ugly, dirty stuff, yeah. All right, that's it. I would like to mention that we have a ransomware summit that I'm co-chairing with one of my 528 instructors, Phil Moore, on June 23rd. It is open and free to everyone. It will be recorded. If you want to register for it, just go to for528.com slash summit 23. If you don't get to that until after June 23rd, then we'll just have a YouTube playlist there for you to watch all the videos. And that's it. Thanks for attending and I appreciate it. All right, any questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, oh, okay. So ransomware actors starting in about 2019 with a group called Maze, like, you know, you traverse a maze. They started stealing your data and exfiltrating data out. The royal we, if you just sat through, by the way, the previous talk, you're probably going, well, not if you're doing what he's doing and correct in that regard. But most of us, the royal we suck, basically, at seeing how much data is just going out the door. And so ransomware actors have been taking advantage of that and using it as the second level or second method of extortion. So it began with, hey, do you want your entire network back? Do you want your data back? And then it moved to not only do you want those things back and unlocked essentially, right? But do you want us to not release this to the world? And it started to become very, very popular and it's not uncommon for them to get hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes out without folks noticing. What's that? Oh, yeah, exactly. You just have to trust the threat actor, duh. <laughs> yeah, just, just trust the thief, of course. Yes, the, the entire business model of paying a ransom is inherently trusting the criminal with whom you're working who has already done you wrong grossly. <laughs> like, so, yeah. So we as the, we, the royal we, like the IT community has taught ourselves to detect ransomware up until the past couple of years was just look for encryption events basically. But that's the last thing you wanna do at this point because by the time you see any type of encryption, you're already way in the hole. They probably already exfiltrated all the data they're going to exfiltrate.
Yeah, yeah, exactly. By that point, like it's already game over anyway. So the, the primary thing to do is initial prevention and deterrence and then early detection and early detection. I mean, you know, the whole class, the class talks about all the methods of that they're the threat actors utilize and how to hunt them and detect them. When it really comes down to it, you need a solid reporting environment and alert generation environment and people with eyes on the prize. If you need, I recommend highly any type of EDR. If you don't have an EDR in your environment and you think you're gonna stop ransomware actors and detect them early, good freaking luck, right? Whatever EDR, you, even if it's like Sysmon, like <laughs> I have talked about Sysmon a lot, folks, <laughs> from my class, they're like, again, this person's gonna talk about Sysmon? Yeah, I am. Microsoft Sysmon is free. Configuration files are widely available. Deploying that out through your environment can be, is stuff here? No, okay, good. Can be <laughs> kind of difficult or it can be very, very easy depending on smaller organizations. But if you deploy a system like that out and you have alerts being generated, it means nothing if you don't have eyes on them. I have a number of clients that, you know, from the past four years or whatever, that'll basically be like, yeah, we didn't know this was happening. And then I log into their EDR and I'm like, yeah, you did. <laughs> like, yeah, you've known for actually two and a half weeks. There's been alerts left and right related to this actor. So having some type of log aggregation system where you have your data aggregated and then alerts running through there or an EDR doing that for you. Also, MDR is very, very helpful if you don't have a team built out to do these things for you. So manage detection and response. Uh, you know, my day job, we have a tool and we have MDR, I, I don't care. Just have something it essentially is what you should have. And having eyes on the prize doesn't mean, oh yeah, we have a security analyst who checks the alerts generated by like Splunk or by our EDR uh, every two days, or so, that's not what that means. <laughs> it means like actually having eyes on it and having you know hourly checks of certain search types and things of that nature and building out a proper response team, which most groups don't have the funds to do. Kind of ruined my answer at the end there. <laughs> I do these things, which a lot of folks can't do. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I could speak to directly. No. So the question was, can you, what about SaaS solutions that you can take into account? So for example, um, Zscaler has some options for quote unquote going dark, but they're not necessarily like in the GUI that you can just be like dark and they go, okay. But at the same time, if you contact them and you, they know your points of presence, they know where you're ingressing, they know where your data traffic is backhauling and they can assist you with that. So there, they have some of them have methods for that, yes, but it's usually not in the, in your tenant where you can just be like boop, you know, like nothing, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's this button do? Click. Oh man, can you imagine? All right, any other questions? All right, cool. Ah, ah. Oh yeah. The algorithms, the question is basically what are some of the more common encryption algorithms utilized by the group, the groups, the crews? Cha-Cha 20 and Cha-Cha 8 seem to be the most common over the past couple of years. Those are usually very well published and easy to find by just looking up a ransomware group. Whenever one of their ransomware samples or variants gets out into the wild, as we call it, into the public, a malware analyst will go, yay, and grab it. And because most of the time they use standard system calls, because if they don't, they end up like beyond Leon and with all their stuff decryptable. So when they do that, it's really easy to see exactly what they do. So like Conti, which was the biggest group for two, two and a half years, they used Cha-Cha 8, and it was very easy to identify that they did that. Uh, I can't remember what Black Bossa uses right now, but Black, the, some of the bigger names, the algorithms they use are very, very well known. It's just the fact that the symmetric key, you know, like good luck with all that. So, um, I, no, not that I'm aware of actually, no, not for the most part, except for the fact that many times some of the newer ones like Black Basta does it and Royal does it. I don't have an alarm going off. Sorry, <laughs> what's this about? Anyway, Black Boston and Royal, they have a methodology where they put, after encrypting the individual files, they will take 
the public encryption key and store it and basically as a footer to the file. They'll append it to the end of the file. And when you look at that particular type of encryption, you can see the key length and potentially at least get the key length. But even then, you're not really going to know the algorithm that was utilized. Questions? Yeah. The, like the malware itself when it's running? Oh, my, personally, me? No. no, 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 no. So I've been doing reverse engineering for maybe eight or nine years, but I have not sat down with a ransomware sample and truly pulled it apart to the point where I was like, oh, look, there's a flaw or something like that. But the redacted group and working with hand in hand with, who did I say did it? Uh, Avast. If you look at their articles, they give you the full breakdown malware analysis on exactly how they read through the code, what they found, and they're like, "Woo, there's the whoopsie, and they break down how they wrote the decryptor. It's phenomenal, it's really cool. Also, we have a talk coming up at the Ransomware Summit. Um, I don't remember who right now, because I'm a bad person, but the talk is entitled like Decrypting Lockbits Encryption Scheme or something like that, and it's gonna go into exactly that process. It's gonna, they're gonna be in IDA, uh, Pro, which is a, a popular disassembler decompiler, and show you exactly how they do it. And I can't wait for that talk. I'm excited for it. Anything else? Beers like beers? Where's the more beer? <laughs> All right. Thanks, folks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good luck with the rest of your, uh, your week for classes. I hope you enjoy whatever class you're in. You better. You better. Never mind. Huh? Yeah, what about him? Yeah. Yeah, I'll make I'll give them to you guys tomorrow. I'll make them available. Pretty much everything, you know, somebody from my company needs to hear. Nice. So, yeah, plus. Yeah. 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 Yeah.